Hello and welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. So glad you can be joining us today, and I am so glad to be joined by regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Hello, Olga. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And for the first time, I'm very pleased to be meeting Kitty Toll, who is a former uh, house rep and also former chair of the um, appropriations committee, who is also running for um, the spot as Lieutenant Governor. So very glad you can be joining us and talking about budgets and policy with us today. Uh, Good morning, Olga. Thank you for having me. And Emily, it's always great to see you again. So, Kitty, um, uh, for the most part, we will be talking about budgets, but I do have two questions that um, we've been asking candidates who can make the show before the the August 9th primary. Mm -hmm. And one of them is, you know, there are so many ways people can serve their community. And if folks go to your campaign website, they will see the, the list of service that you have had over the years. But I am curious of all the ways you can serve your community, why do you, have you chosen elected office? Oh, that, that's an interesting question. Um, it, it, it was rooted in me when I was <clears throat> a very young child by my mother. Uh, she was always very interested in politics and um, politics were talked around the kitchen table for as long as I can remember. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, She did serve in the legislature back in the 60s, and she was very active when Governor Hoff uh, was uh, was elected governor back in in the early 60s. And my mother uh, always said that she was a Democrat in in a time when Democrats could hold a meeting in a phone booth. And (laughs) and that's not too far from the truth. We live in the Northeast Kingdom, and it, it's a rural area. It was a little, it, quite a bit more conservative back then. And um, a woman running for um, the legislature uh, was a difficult feat. And, and she did win that election. And then she went on to uh, try to um, uh, get a seat in the Senate and um, was not able to win that, but always remained very active in politics. And I had an aunt that lived in Washington, D.C., and when we would visit, it was my mom's sister. She was very like, very much like my mom, and we would visit the Capitol, visit our senators and our representative. And um, so it, it was just a seed that has always been planted there from my mom. And uh, remind us of your mom's name. Catherine Beatty. She served in the, um, it was interesting, because of this year with, um, with redistricting, she served in the, the one year term where the house went from one, uh, one town, one vote. Oh, wow. To, um, 150 legislators. So it, it, was, it was a big change, especially for all of us that lived in small towns. We had one vote in larger towns and even cities had just one vote. Mm-hmm. Oh, that must have been fascinating. Yeah, and I was I was I was very young at the time. I and there was no kindergarten at that time, and I spent many days with her in the legislature. You know, sometimes I would stay home on the farm with my father, uh, but many days she took me with her. And as a five-year-old, I just ran or walked, I hope politely, around the <laughs> halls of the, leg- of the state house. And and I remember spending an awful lot of time down in Ledge Council. They were. They were very kind to me, and uh, and uh, I, I just remember being there and being in the balcony and watching and, and just walking around alone, which probably would not happen today. <laughs> you know, Kitty, I don't know if you've ever talked to Carolyn Wesley about this, Becca Balance, Chief of Staff, but she has very similar memories of her own childhood and remembers actually sleeping on Janet Ansel's couch, I think, when Janet was on Ledge Council, and like... Um, or maybe when she was in the governor's office and just like has that same memory of just like walking around alone, being sort of like dragged to the state house, everyone being very kind. It's really when I um, meet colleagues whose younger children have come with them just for the day even, I have like, it's so nice to have your memories or Carolyn's memories and to know I'm creating those same memories in those kids. It's pretty incredible. 
my, 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 my favorite one of, well, it, it, I think it's a favorite memory, but not a great one. Um, I was looking down over the balcony uh, at some men because it was mostly men in the legislature at that time. And, and my knee went in between two of the little pillars and then I couldn't get it out. And the more I tried, the more I couldn't get it out. And, and finally, you know, someone looked up and asked if I was okay. And I can remember they were talking about having to saw off one of the pillars, but somebody got some lotion and finally <laughs> able to get my knee out. But that, that, that is, that is a memory that sticks in, that has always stuck with me. I'm glad I didn't have to damage a historic piece of the legislature by, by cutting away one of the pillars. <laughs> but you know, it, it probably, if, if that had happened, there would have been a story forever throughout uh, yeah. the state house. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you for sharing um, those memories with us, Kitty. Much appreciated. Um, and uh yeah, it's actually given me some ideas for cocktails, but we'll do that later in the show. We um, spoke with uh, another lieutenant governor candidate uh, the other day, David Zuckerman, um, and we happened to hit on budgets. And the reason that that conversation is fresh in my mind is because I think, Emily, you might agree, it hit on some themes that we have talked about in this show before, and I'm hoping... Um, Kitty, you will dive into this with us a little deeper. That theme of having a balanced budget or a well-resourced budget, and are they always the same thing? And what does it mean to actually invest in different programs through the state budget? Um, Emily, do you wanna kind of add anything to that? Um, I think that's sort of the basic theme. And part of it is because through the pandemic, Olga and I have been talking so much about sort of mm -hmm. scarcity and abundance and how it changes the way we think creatively and all of those things. Um, but the, and then a bigger part is actually a pre, and someone else we were talking to recently, um, we were just talking about sort of what it means to be able to invest upstream in order to mm -hmm. save money downstream and how hard that is given the committee structure given the fact that, you know, spending double is very rarely a possibility in these times. And so those were some of just like, would love to hear your thoughts on sort of that big picture. Yeah, there, there's lots of pieces here that, that I'd like to touch upon. And um, a balanced budget is very important. Um, I, I'm being on appropriations and, and sharing the appropriations for four years, a balanced budget is very important, but a, a well-resourced budget is a very different budget. And so I recognize those, those two things. Um, first, I wanna say for viewers out there or people who are listening, Vermont is the only state that is not required by its constitution to pass a balanced budget. However, mm -hmm. Vermont always passes a balanced budget. And not only do we pass a balanced budget, we do the mid-year adjustment in January to true it up, to make sure it's in line to then balance again at the end of the year. So it's a three checkpoint and for not having a, a constitutional requirement like other states, we really do do that work. Um, unlike some other states, some other states have um, you know, a finance committee or they may have different names for it where they actually do uh, the appropriations in the raising of funds in the same committee. Mm -hmm. um, Vermont, we have a Ways and Means Committee in the House and a Finance Committee in the Senate uh, that, that looks at tax structure and looks at uh, raising revenue. And then we have the appropriations committee that determined by the work of uh, the tax committees, uh, we, we have X amount of dollars to appropriate. So we have a different structure. Other states have our structure and other states have where one committee does both. And, and that may, you know, our, our communications in Vermont is very good. Um, and I feel that we work well with our tax committees. Um, but I can see in other states uh, where there's pros and cons to having one committee that does both. And um, the time that I was in the legislature, I was elected in 2008 and then started in 2009, we were deep in a recession. And, and we were moving through that recession where there were huge gaps in, in our budgets. I remember the first gap was over 200, um, uh, was over $200 million. 
And, and that is a large gap between the amount of revenues that our state economists have told us we can count on and what our expenses are. And even if you keep a flat, uh, you know, you keep a flat budget, there are expenses that increase on their own. And, and so trying to accommodate for those expenses became very, very challenging during the recession. And then when we started finally moving out of the recession, we came right into COVID. And so it's been difficult times for quite a long time, but uh, we have done balanced budgets and we have, uh, I think, done the best we can with the work of our policy committees to um, move forward, making investments in housing and in climate and in you know, programs for families and children and, and the elderly and you know, food security. We've made many investments because we've had what is called one-time dollars, where our state economists see more money. They, they have seen more money coming into the state, but they, get, they cannot guarantee that it's ongoing. And so for many of those years in the, in, you know, the 2013 through 17, we were seeing lots of one-time dollars, but we could not count on them to be year after year. And so to invest them in, in ongoing programs was not an option because we did not have that insurance at the time. Mm -hmm. and so I'll let you stop and then I can talk about, you know, investments upstream and-, and Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, that's the, when we think about the one-time money and think about sort of these investments upstream, I think for me, justice reinvestment is the most explicit example for me. I think partly just because it was sort of named, mm -hmm. um, in a way that more members got their head around the idea that we are doing this sort of upstream activity in order to save money downstream. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so we sort of sold it as a policy idea from that perspective. But I know that our actual budgeting, it's not like it all was going then into like, it's not like the savings was then going into a special fund to be looped back around. So it's not, it was more of, um, an abstract idea of reinvesting than a practical idea of reinvesting. And I don't, I'm not sure actually what the pros and cons of that are. I generally think special, we go a little far in the special funds department. Um, and it's, we mostly use them as political tools rather than fiscal tools. And so I'm curious your thoughts on just sort of like, if that worked as a way of really getting that loop going, if there, you have other ideas on how to really be doing um, similar upstream investments to save money downstream? I mean, I know early care and education is one idea, but it's not like that's a 20 So can I frame. just yeah. jump in quickly uh, and give Kitty a, a minute to think about the, her answer? But Emily, just for the sake of listeners, when you talk about political tool, using political tools versus fiscal tools, mm -hmm. can you give us some examples? Yeah, sure. So um, justice reinvestment is in some ways a good example of that. So um, we branded it justice reinvestment. It was a really like long thought out sort of deep policy area of the idea that we sort of save money long term by investing in um, diversion and um, prevention around the carceral system. Mm -hmm. Because as I think most people know, putting people in jail is actually just incredibly expensive in addition to destroying people's lives. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the moral argument against putting people in jail, it's also a deep fiscal argument for how expensive it is. And we actually, um, our ability to bill the feds for certain um, pieces of care of that population is very diminished when people are incarcerated, but possible when people are in the community, like Medicaid, for instance. Okay. So we're um, saving money by keeping people out of jail, out of prison, but, when we sort of talk about it as justice reinvestment, um, it's we're selling an idea to our colleagues. That's why I mean it as sort of a political solution. We're not actually physically taking, like accounting for every last dollar we're saving by the individuals that are not being incarcerated and putting them into a special fund that then magically gets invested in, you know, trauma-informed care for fifth graders so they're not incarcerated later. And so that's right. what I mean. It's a policy solution abstractly in that it's probably gonna improve people's lives. And it's um, a fiscal solution abstractly in that it will save us money. But really the branding of it as reinvestment is sort of a way of talking to our colleagues about the political and policy idea. 
great. Thank you. Appreciate sure. that. Thank you. Thank you, Emily and Olga. This is, this is um, we, we hear the uh, proposals and policies in action, and there's really two pieces. Um, what is best for Vermonters and, and, and people who are impacted by the policy? And also, is there any savings? And, um, and hopefully our focus is always what's best for Vermonters first. And uh, obviously with justice reinvestment, doing more with diversion and keeping people out of the incarcerated uh, from being incarcerated is, is really critical, especially you know, nonviolent offenders um, you know, we're, we're just seeing a spiraling down when they're incarcerated. And, and, and if we can provide them with, um, you know, substance use treatment and we can provide them with jobs and education, it, it's such a healthier outcome. So healthier outcomes, uh, you know, I think always have to be the primary focus. We do hear and we have heard for a long time about savings and we've done it in education. We've done it with, you know, substance misuse. And, and you know, for me, the outcome for the individual is always the most important. And, and as you said, these savings are often abstract and maybe they will be seen years out after we really turn a system. But the short-term savings, I, I never found a flood of money coming into appropriations from a change that we had made. Uh, maybe there was some pressure that was not on the budget for individuals who would have uh, gone into you know, other parts of the system uh, but there was never in my time that I can pinpoint large savings that, that we could then invest somewhere else. Uh, you know, we lived through the challenges for change error. I don't, you weren't in the legislature then. No, but I worked in human services then. So oh. I've heard a lot about it. You know, you know, spend less and, and have better outcomes. And, and, you know, we, you know, it, it was in theory, it, it, it sounded very good. And, and, you know, some were very hopeful but actually to see uh, the better outcomes in the savings, um, I, I, I don't remember any that I can pinpoint that made a, a huge difference. Um, but, beyond, be, but beyond that, um, I really wanna talk about you know, upstream services. It only makes sense and, we, and you know, to see the savings will be probably years and years out. But when you're talking about uh, substance misuse and you're talking about people's healthcare, it seems that for many years, we always address crises. And if we could turn that ship and put the money into prevention and into education and do it upstream, the problem is turning the money from the services that are, that are um, in effect now and, and using that money upstream. And, and, and that is where the difficulty is. And <clears throat> the only way to do that is to either uh, start making some other really tough priority choices in the budget where we defund areas or identifying new revenue to do more of the uh, upstream preventative type activities, whether it's healthcare, uh, substance misuse, or um, you know, in within the legal system for individuals. Yeah, it's really, you know, that time frame of you know, 20, 30 years, we're generally talking about generational change, right? Yes. If when we're talking about upstream investments um, and even sometimes multi-generational change, you know, helping a three-year-old so that maybe, you know, their kids won't need the same level of services. Early intervention, um, you know, early intervention, yeah. especially into homes that, you know, where, where, where children are having a very difficult time um, but, you know, as we know, much of that is identified in schools and, and teachers are, are beyond stress, especially going through COVID with all they're being asked to do. And, and you know, and so we do know some children slip through and, and are not identified as needing help when and <clears throat> there's a lot going on at home and that child needs help. And that's when that early intervention is so key. Yeah, absolutely. And so then, but we have this two-year budget cycle. And we, I have not seen any system in state government that even comes close to accounting for the 20 year cycle. You know, we, um, various administrations have done something around results-based accountability or, um, you know, Governor Scott moved that into lean. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of looks at a longer arc, but it very rarely um, connects back 
to the budgeting work. And we very rarely sort of look across that time and how we're doing our work, partly because we have, you know, because of this two year cycle. Um, and so I, do you have ideas for how we can sort of stretch beyond the two year cycle to do our work in a, within act, the actual arc of people's lives? Yeah, Emily, you, you hit the nail on the head. The two year cycle is, is really very difficult because it, it seems like uh, you're, you know, you gear up in the first year of the biennium, you, you get work out the, the second year of the biennium and some in the first year, but then committees change, you're up for a new election cycle and it's always a start, stop, start, stop. And, and you know, four years, I think, you know, for many office holders would be very, you know, would be a, a plus like they do in, in many other states. I know when uh, through the Council of State Governments or, you know, going to conventions with NCSL, uh, other legislators that you meet are very surprised that, you know, even our governor uh, is just a, a two year, um, a, a two year position. And so the starting and stopping really hinders. And then you have new members and you have, you know, which is good that you, you know, you have new perspectives, but it, it, it is not allowing us, uh, in my opinion, to do the long range planning that is needed in the long range work. Uh, just because of the start and start, the start and stop uh, cycle of this two year, um, you know, a two year election. Do you think there's a role for the lieutenant governor in supporting long range planning? I mean, in some ways, I feel like it's one of the most depoliticized of the offices in state mm -hmm. government, mm -hmm. um, partly because of your sort of essential powerlessness, but partly because you sort <laughs> of sit between so many different players. Right. Uh, that, that, you know, that I really appreciate that question. And um, you're right that the lieutenant governor, uh, as far as, you know, committees and policies and taking votes, except for a tie, uh, you know, the power is very limited in that office. However, it allows you um, uh, to have a very loud and very clear voice and to really relate the voice of Vermonters. And, you know, that that's what I, I you know, I think I could bring to that office, especially understanding our budgets and our budget constraints. Um, you know, when, when we talk about the funding for childcare, we really need to address childcare in, in this state and um, we need to find a funding solution for it. And, um, you know, I think the office of Lieutenant Governor would be a great place to convene meetings of, you know, bringing in people from all sides, bringing all the stakeholders to the table and, you know, really brainstorm what are ideas of, you know, how we can either partner with others or just do it through the state or, you know, what models are used in other in other states and um, and bring people together to, uh, you know, start getting good ideas uh, that would move into possible policy. But obviously, the lieutenant governor's office is very tied when it comes to uh, having a policy committee take it up and, and vote on it. But certainly, could do the work and convene meetings and bring people together. Um, yeah, it, we've talked about long-term planning before and I maybe this exists and I just don't know it, but I find it interesting that every town has a process to create a town plan, which is like this guiding document. And we don't have something similar at the state level, do we? Well, every governor sort of creates some sort of plan for their administration. But again, two years. Right. Um, most departments have some sort of strategic plan within their departments. But again, two years, by the time they're done writing it, generally, it's time to wind down that phase of the administration. A few new legislators this last term um, were pushing really hard for the idea of a planning office within mm -hmm. state government um, that wasn't doing sort of you know, it wasn't land use planning, it was planning, strategic planning writ large. I um, really appreciated their initiative about it and like that there was a problem they were identifying and trying to do something about. I had a lot of trouble getting my head around how that wouldn't just be like another office shouting into the wind. Um, mm -hmm. And, but maybe I was just having a very grouchy day whenever I talked to them. Kitty, what do you, <laughs> Kitty, what do you think? <laughs> Well, well, hopefully that is that is what all the uh, agencies and departments are doing are doing this this long term planning. Uh, but as you said, Emily, you know you have a two year gubernatorial cycle and you have uh, commissioners and secretaries that cycle in and out and 
and then new and fresh ideas come in and um, and you know the the crisis or the pressure points you know change you know many many are the same you know when it comes to housing and, and substance use and um, so I, I'm I'm not sure uh, how the coordination would be between the the governor's cabinet which really is where I see that that planning happening and and then. Um, you know, I would like to see more coordination then with the policy committees, with the priorities of the governor's cabinet. And I know that's difficult when, when they're uh, opposing parties, uh, but I think there could be more communication of, of where we want to see Vermont go. Mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I, I like the idea and the thought of a, a, a you know, a, a planning a planning group or uh, an office of planning but I, I, I as, as you said, I'm trying to sort out in my head, um, you know, would the work be just, um, you know, duplicate work from what the commissioners and the secretaries are doing? And it seems like it would be an awful lot of time trying to coordinate with all those areas unless you targeted, you know, a, a very, uh, you know, a very strict area of planning. But I would like to just see planning for the whole state be more long range than it is now, but I think we're hampered by the two year cycle. Hmm. And I know that, I think in talking to legislators who have been around longer than I have, I think chairs and even some members who aren't chairs sort of do their own version of long range planning, but they sort of keep it to themselves. It's, you know, like they have a, you know, and sometimes in partnership with a um, advocacy group or with another colleague, that there's sort of an internal long range plan, you know, we'll do this bill this year, which will build up to this one this year. Um, but that's, that's not something that we usually talk about as publicly as we could. Right. Uh, that's true. And, and I can see in appropriations, we, you know, some long range planning was, this was before the pandemic, our, our state reserves were not where they should have been. If you you know, look at, I call it the industry standards between other states and what's recommended by um, you know, by national groups, it you know we were told that our our, um, our reserve should be between you know twelve and eighteen percent, and we were well below that. And so that was some long range planning over the time I was on appropriations. And when I was chair, you know, I really pushed with these one time dollars that we couldn't count on as ongoing was to build our state reserves in case there was ever a real crisis or an emergency or another recession or God forbid, a depression. And uh, we were doing that before we knew about the pandemic and um, all these federal dollars came into the state. But if the federal dollars had not come into the state, we would need those reserves to shore up programs until we could make major changes in, in figuring out how to move forward. So we are in a healthy place with our reserves, which um, you know I'm very proud of that, and and that's and I think that's a, an example of long range planning. But it's it's just a small point in all of state government. Mm-hmm. So we have to um, thank you, Kitty, for that. We have to head to break to hear from some of our underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro your community radio station. So stay tuned. We will be right back with Lieutenant Governor Candidate Kitty Toll. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. So glad you can be joining us. And if you are just tuning in, I'm speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser as well as Kitty Toll, who is running for the position of Lieutenant Governor here in Vermont. And a reminder to everyone, our primary is August 9th, but that uh, early voting has already started. So if you wanna reach out to either the Secretary of State's office or your town clerk for an early ballot, you may do that and it will arrive in your mailbox. And how exciting is that? Um, Emily, what do we need to remind listeners of? Well, the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests and not the station, nor their employers, nor their family or friends. Why, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Kitty, this part of the show brings me to the second question that I'm asking all the candidates who can come on the show before the primary. I 
<laughs> when you think about Vermont and you think about it, how to make it work better for everyone, what is the one policy that you would love to see enacted uh, that you feel would, would make Vermont better for everyone? And it can just be the, the policy that could set off a domino effect, but where would you focus? Um, boy, that, that's a tough question because there's so many areas and, and to pin it down, but um, I, I, the policy, I don't know what the exact policy would be because there's several that would lead to it, but we need to make Vermont welcoming to everybody and, uh, and, and, and work for everybody. And we, the legislature, I wasn't there this year, but I was there in years that led up to some of this legislation, but with environmental justice, and with truth and reconciliation, we're taking these steps that is, that is recognizing that everyone has not always uh, been in, on the same um, level of playing field. And uh, in the treatment of some is not like the treatment of others. And policy that just makes Vermont welcoming, open, and, uh, and uh, policies, and, and not policy, but uh, programs that, that support families and individuals have to be equally accessible and um, a voice in government. Everyone has to have a voice in government. And so I believe that is where we really need to move forward. And we've made steps and we just need to continue in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, we were talking before the break about budgets and planning and fiscal tools and I'd like to touch on some of, I always find it interesting, especially when, I'm, when I was covering a town meeting for the local newspaper, how people would stand up in town meeting and talk about budgets. And, you know, we, we all humans carry so much baggage around money, but there was always phrases I would hear like, well, this saving money makes sense here, or this is just common sense to, you know, to not spend money here or spend money there. And I'm curious from your perspective, Kitty, when considering state finances, what are some of the um, either stories the legislature tends to tell around money or approaches that it takes towards money? And, um, are they helpful or do we need to rethink even how we approach some of these uh, fiscal decisions? Yeah, um, it's a, that's, that's very interesting. And, um, I, you know, being on the budget committee, I, I saw many things at work and, and sometimes uh, the quieter voices are the ones that are not heard and are left behind. And so it, it when, when we're considering, um, how we spend our state's resources, which are limited, we really need to, um, and this is, was not always done in the past, but we really need to bring the policy committees um, into those discussions because they're the ones that often hear stories that in appropriations we don't hear. We take testimony mostly from uh, the commissioners and the secretaries from you know, the governor's administration. We do hold public hearings and those are critical. Those are so important. But if you're not able to call in or Zoom in or attend in, in, um, in person, uh, then your voice may not be heard. And, and so trying to find ways uh, to hear from everyone, the smallest voice is, is so important. And in my time in the legislature, <clears throat> the best stories that I heard often came from uh, kids and teenagers and young adults. Uh, when they would make the time to come into the building and would talk to you in the hallway or talk to you in a, in a, you know, a public hearing, um, just hearing the, the rawness and the, um, uh, the honesty from a, a younger person really, really would hit home. And, and so I would like to see um, more youth involvement or a way to get <clears throat> more youth voices because they're the ones that are so impacted by the decisions we make when it comes to substance misuse and comes to education. And they know what's working and not working for them in school or you know, in programs that they may be accessing. And I, I would like to hear more from youth. Yeah, it's funny. I was at a um, 
little gathering last night um, in a neighborhood around here. And all of the adults were sort of sitting, you know, I, I'd given a little campaign speechish thing, very small one. And everyone was sort of sitting around and asking me questions and having a conversation. And there was a few youth sitting there, mostly adults and mostly some older adults. And folks were talking about how hard it was for kids these days and how things have changed. And everyone was just sort of like talking about what it's like to be a youth. And no one was sort of attending to the youth who were there to ask them what they wanted until like, it, it took a lot to pivot the conversation. And it was interesting how much, um, I think, you know, the legislative body being what it is, how much we are informed by our own experience of our children or our grandchildren. Or um, I remember when racial justice conversations really came to the fore in the legislature, how much I heard from colleagues that it was sort of their grandkids had told them they had to do this or their kids had told them they had to do this. Um, and I think it would be powerful to have that come sort of more directly from people rather than um, in the background. I had one story about budgeting that um, is sort of a lesson that I learned that I think is really interesting. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> so when the pandemic first hit, I remember thinking, this is a rainy day, people. Like, what are you talking about? Like, this is the rainy day we've been waiting for. Like, it's not gonna get rainier than this. Like, this is, you know, this is the Noah's Ark flood, you know, mm -hmm. that we've been sort of saving the reserves for. Like, why are we calling? And I remember just being like, so righteous. Why are we like, why are we saving this money in this reserve? Like, this is rain. We need to invest in Vermonters. We need to pull all this money back out. And I was wrong. Like, that wasn't, you know, we had the resources. We, we needed to spend our resources differently. And I'd love to hear how you, you know, how you led on that because we spent them incredibly well. Um, but the actual need to spend the reserves wasn't there because that federal flood of money came in and we didn't need to. And now we'll actually have that money for if the federal spending dries up, um, mm -hmm. which is predicted to happen, but who knows, right? And so that was a really interesting, that was a really interesting moment for me to realize I was wrong because, you know, that's very good for humans. Um, <laughs> but this sort of difference between it's a rainy day in terms of like people have different needs and it's a rainy day, the budget has a different need. And so I appreciated that you were like really stood strong in that idea that we need to spend differently, but we don't necessarily need um, a different set of resources. So would love to hear your thoughts on all of that pandemic spending. But your instinct was absolutely correct, Emily. Your instinct was correct that we, we saw we saw all of this, you know, it was a very devastating time and we saw a real darkness coming. And had those federal dollars not come in or not come in as quick as they did, we would have had, you know, we may have had to have depended on those, on those reserves in order to, to bridge us over. Um, that would have been several months out because we did, you know, there, there was money within the system to, to continue things on. But boy, without the federal dollars, that could have dried up very, very quickly. And knowing you know, with businesses having to shut down and unemployment and, and people, you know, needing funding. And so when those dollars came in, uh, they were a real lifeboat to us. And I know that there's, you know, you know, there's pros and cons to those dollars coming in because they do have to be paid back. We, we do have to figure out, and, and that will be what you know, our congressional delegation will do, you know, how we move forward uh, with, with federal dollars. But in Vermont, uh, when the, the first set of money came in, it was <clears throat> the, the relief dollars, the coronavirus relief fund. And to get 1.25 billion was more money than we could ever, ever have imagined in Vermont. And, and there was other money coming in to Vermont. And I think in total, Vermont has received over $10 billion uh, of federal aid. <clears throat> Some has gone out you know, directly to businesses for economic impact payments, uh, you know, some went out to unemployment and to schools. And so money went out in many different avenues. The uh, legislature ended up appropriating, I think just um, about uh, 1.25, 1.25, uh, under 300, under 300, um, 1.25 billion. I'm doing this twice. 3.5 uh, billion. Two and a half billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that the legislature it was just under two and a half billion dollars that the legislature 
uh, appropriated. But, you know, that was what the legislature appropriated, but over 10 billion came into the state that went directly to hospitals and, um, you know, that, that was sent through FEMA and education supports and healthcare. It was all over the place. Um, it was an amount of money that we could never have have ever imagined. And so Vermont, even though there was a lot of hardship, we fared very well compared to other states. In fact, um, we were number three per capita in receiving the greatest amount of money. I believe Washington, D.C., which is not a state, but per capita, they did the best. Uh, New York and then and then Vermont. Um, Senator Leahy, uh, there was a provision called the small state minimum. And so there was a floor for small states and, and we fared very well, which allowed us, you know, to get food out. And, you know, the Everyone Eats program, every town, I've, or many towns that I've been in, people have said what a wonderful program where, you know, restaurant style meals are, are ready to go and, and out to people who need them. And uh, along with the, the good work of our food bank and our food pantries around the state, but you know, we were able to be there with assistance. And Emily, I think you you were there when we were all making calls for individuals to help with unemployment. Um, and, it, you know, our system was crashing because our, you know, we have, you know, our, our old uh, computer mainframes are really old. And, and uh, we were helping people with unemployment, but also there was the other group that the self-employed that could also... Um, uh, received dollars. And that was a whole new program that Vermont was able to set up quickly. And it took longer for some. I know it took longer for some and was frustrating, but legislators pitched in and we made those phone calls and, and we helped people uh, receive um, when they were not able to work, when the state was shut down or their businesses were closed that were not considered, um, uh, you know, um, uh, businesses as were necessities. Uh, those those monies kept families going and kept the economy going in Vermont. Yeah, you know, I am um, very, very cautious about Vermont exceptionalism, but I was, um, and then I go to a national conference. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I think, <laughs> whoa, this place is amazing. And it's not just like the trauma of traveling, but it's talking <laughs> to other, other states about what their state legislatures did through the pandemic. So I was just at a fiscal leaders conference in DC um, a few weeks ago with Janet and some JFO staff and Ann mm -hmm. Cummings. And um, we had a few sort of focus groups that were very explicitly about how did you spend, you know, your federal dollars? What did you do to make it through the pandemic? And just, you know, time after time after time hearing about how you know, when the first round of coronavirus relief money came before the ARPA money came, we spent that in such a strategic way that it sounded to me like ARPA money was actually tagged to the way we had spent coronavirus relief money. You know, this emphasis on keeping people housed, um, the emphasis on making sure people have food, the way we did school lunches through that first summer, through that first period with delivery, the Everyone Eats program, just all of these like really both innovative and just deeply common sense ways we spent that felt just like, yes, of course, this is how we should be doing this, you know. Um, think about the school bus. Go ahead. I was just say, think about the school bus drivers, the schools that got those school lunch programs. And instead of picking up kids, they did their school bus routes and, and they dropped off food. And, you know, just that kind of creativity and maybe it's because we're a smaller state and, and we can turn more quickly on, on a dime, I don't know, or maybe we have the systems in place or, you know, you know our value system in Vermont really is we, we need to take care of people first and, you know, we don't do it as 100% and there's areas where we fall down in. But our, our communities, you know, we still have strong communities and we know neighbors that are struggling. And I think that does set Vermont apart. Mm -hmm. No, and I had, you know, I have pretty massive complaints with our unemployment insurance system and um, both the technology and how our department delivered or did not deliver services to Vermonters and how they've not been able to really show up to partner with the legislature to make changes. But... 
you know, the strength of our unemployment insurance fund going into the pandemic as Mm -hmm. similar Mm -hmm. to our Mm -hmm. big budget, you know, we, after the recession, we set up a system of reserves, we stuck to it. And so when the pandemic came, we were one of the only states in the country that did not have to seek extra money, did not have to spend our coronavirus relief funds or our ARPA funds, did not have to get a loan from the feds in order Mm. to sustain our unemployment insurance program, even though we had more unemployed folks in Vermont than a lot of other states because of our dependence on the hospitality industry. And so this this sort of, um, to go back to what Olga was saying about sort of cultural stories, I am not originally from New England and this like very New England, like, you know, um, tightness with the purse and cautiousness and like, you know, reserves and like keeping the money in the coffee can underneath the, you know, underneath the kitchen sink or whatever people do. Um, It's called squirreling. What? (laughs) It's called squirreling. Squirreling. Yeah, very New England squirreling. It's like not, um, it's not sort of like my cultural instinct in the same way that I think it is for, you know, you two who grew up in, you know, in the hills. Um, But to see it work through the pandemic um, to see this, how we were able to really marry this expansion of services to meet people's needs um, because we had been cautious earlier was really a powerful lesson for me. I I can remember my mother um, often saying, and she would be very frustrated with with all of us that that, uh, we didn't appreciate hard times. She had lived through the depression and, you know, she said, you know, I, I lived through the depression where, you know, there, there was no food. And fortunately, where we live in Vermont, you're on a farm. So you have vegetables and you have animals and milk. And, and so we, you know, we fared or she fared better here. But um, she, she really um, was frustrated and, and knew that we didn't appreciate what we had enough and, 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 was not, and that we were not planning enough for a very hard time. And I think when someone lives through that and you know, I'd kind of roll my eyes at her as a kid, you know, when, when you, you used every bit of butter and now I do, I mean, I use every bit of butter on, you know, if, if there's any on the paper, I set it on top of my vegetables while they're cooking. So it melts down in, but I realized I was watching her do things where she made sure there was no waste. And, um, and I, 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 I'm sure I'm not as good as, as she was, but there was a lot of frustration with her and concern that we didn't appreciate what we needed to do to prepare for another bad time. Mm-hmm. My stepfather is a depression baby as well. <clears throat> and uh, I, I received a similar lecture yesterday on our way to a doctor's appointment, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's, it's good to remember because as, as the pandemic showed us, sometimes you, you need to have that that extra whatever kind of packed away. And she, I, if you watch your pennies, your dollars will take care of themselves. And, uh, you know, she oh, just- Oh, yeah, yep. <laughs> I've never heard, heard that one too. That <laughs> and, and patch on patch, dollar on dollar. That's the other one I grew up with. Oh, I hadn't, I have not heard that one. And I appreciate that I think um, the political moment that we're in in Vermont and the social moment we're in Vermont, we're able to sort of balance that New England cautiousness. And I do actually do that with the butter and the vegetables. So I, oh, good, perhaps, good. I perhaps I have more instincts than I thought I did. Um, maybe I just really like butter. But I think that where we are in this political moment right now, we are able to balance this real, like, you know, visionary cautiousness. So I think what we did with Prop 5 and reproductive, you know, um, Mm -hmm. justice and abortion rights is like a visionary cautiousness, right? Like hard times are coming and we will be prepared to protect each other. Um, And building up reserves for the hard times with this expansiveness that everyone really deserves to have their needs met. And so I think that's a really interesting thing that we have happening in Vermont with, because of our sort of trust and community, our caring for each other, that sometimes, and um, sort of the mix of people sort of come from that New England spirit and folks who are newer to the area, that we're now able to balance those two things. Whereas maybe 30 years ago, the legislature was just cautious, right? Right. 
I also, I really, and, and, you know, as, as you said, you know, not making Vermont seem to be exceptional, but I, I think we are exceptional. I just see us being a leader in so many areas and, and, and looking at what has happened with the latest Supreme Court ruling with the EPA. I mean, I'm, I'm just the loss for words. I, I just see investments that we can make in Vermont, um, you know, investments in, um, in uh, addressing uh, emissions through uh, transportation initiatives that we're taking and also through weatherization projects, but also, you know, the work that's being done to, um, to really invigorate downtown communities and more housing in downtown so it's more walkable and people are walking and driving less and have access, you know, to, to stores and post office and, and community events. Vermont has to be and continue to be a model and I think that, you know, these investments in important areas, whether it's education, environment, uh, climate change, uh, we are really modeling to the rest of the nation. And I, what you said earlier, Emily, where you go to a national convention and you talk about what we do in Vermont, that is not happening in all other states. Um, and in light of many of the rulings with the Supreme Court, uh, when it comes around, you know, firearms, uh, Prop 5, and the environment, uh, we have to be a leader here in Vermont and keep pushing forward. Um, we're small, but I often, you know, you know, look at us as, you know, the the we're shaking the dog's tail quite often, as we did with GMOs. You know, we did and we made we made the federal government um, have to react, and they did, and they hadn't reacted in much lately uh, at that time. So. Um, I, I think Vermont is exceptional and uh, we have our issues, but boy, are we way ahead of other states. So just doing a quick time check here, we have about five minutes before the end of this um, segment. So I want to check in uh, both Emily and, and Kitty. When it comes to that initial question that launched our conversation, you know, a balanced budget or a, a well-resourced budget, or that question of investment, what do you feel is important for folks to understand uh, about how we invest in Vermont and where we invest? And am I starting or is Emily starting? Whoever wants to jump in first. Well, I'll, I'll jump in first. <laughs> it's, it's, truly, it's truly a balancing act. And um, and it is, uh, it's important that we pass a balanced budget, but when there's, you know, initiatives and investments that need to be made, we know we need to make investments in childcare. And, um, and, and that is going to be a very uh, serious discussion when the legislature comes back into session in January. Uh, how do we do it? Can, can we partner with other groups? And where will these dollars come from? And uh, you know, do we raise new revenue or do we reprioritize some things in the budget? And I will tell you, that's very hard is as soon as you try to make reductions in other areas, advocates for those areas and people impacted uh, make it very difficult for any change, even in the smallest amount. And, um, and so these are going to be very difficult discussions, but I would say, um, you know, Ongoing childcare funding is going to be, um, you know, a, a hot topic, and it is a priority. We're very fortunate with all these one-time dollars to help us with broadband and and uh, housing initiatives, uh, which all support our economy. But um, you know, I, I funding for childcare is is with housing and broadband. That's what's going to keep young people here, attract new families, keep businesses here, and attract new businesses. Those are the the three key items that I really see, um, you know, standing up and improving our economy. And then we have the big issue, which is climate change. It's a balancing act uh, and working well with our policy committees. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kitty. Emily, anything you want to add to that? Um, I just, I think there's a national conversation around, um, mostly on the left around sort of what sufficiency looks like, what abundance looks like, what the role of government is in that, what the role of taxation is in that. And I just am very careful in my own mind to be separating those two things. The federal government's ability to tax and spend um, 
to run a deficit, that a deficit is in fact a policy tool at the federal mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. is a very, very different thing than at the state level where we really do have a much, we have a closed loop. Um, deficit spending is not a policy tool. We do not actually print our own money here in Vermont. Um, and our ability to raise revenues here is very, very different, not just given that people sort of, um, especially wealthy folks can move across borders very easily, but even more so that, that we just have a limited pool of humans with a limited pool of dollars to draw on. And so it changes the conversation um, very seriously at the policy level to be doing that within the state versus within the full nation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hard for many of us who are reading our way between sort of national news and state news, national policy conversations and state level policy conversations to remember that we do need to discern between those two things when we're talking about um, sufficiency. Thank you, Emily. So Kitty, if people wanted to learn more about you or uh, connect with you at all, uh, where should they go? What's the best way to do that? They, 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 can, they can Google Kitty Toll and they would come to my web, website, Kitty for Vermont. Uh, that, that's the best place. Or um, uh, contacting me on, you know, send me an email, send me a text. Uh, I've been handing out cards with my cell number and uh, with, with, my, um, with my personal email or my campaign is uh, kitty at kittyforbt.com. And those are all ways to be in touch with me. I'm, I'm pretty public, I'm pretty accessible, and uh, I look forward to hearing from anyone who has questions or has thoughts and concerns they'd like to share. Wonderful, Emily. Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and you'll get links to all of the social medias and my email and phone number. Um, also hosting events every other Wednesday on the town common for folks to meet other statewide candidates in the primary and make sure that those statewide candidates are hearing from folks in Brattleboro and Wyndham County about what we care about. Thank you. And as always, the Montpelier Happy Hour is airs at 2 p.m. on Friday on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on BCTV. We thank them very much for all their support, as well as our Facebook page, our Captivate page, <laughs> and wherever you find your podcasts. See you next week, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you.